for people are sitting around in a circle or a quasi circle. One of them, Terence McKenna, the American philosopher and poetist. The second person is Erika Niedfeld, his companion. The third one is Louis Edward Luna, a young colonial gentleman. And Fidel Dutko is the fourth one, a Hungarian ex soccer player. His name is unknown yet, but we try to figure it out because this scene is probably the first occasion in a process that is unfolding. I don't have to tell you that these people are going to go in a circle for a while to sell me. So, this is probably the first ceremony that we can call as the start of the globalization of Ayahuasca. What globalization means? When Ayahuasca is leaving its birthplace, the Amazon basin, and even nowadays it's very modern of the world in different forms, in shaman ceremonies, or in the form of synthetic churches. 2006, the Liberty was um, accepted to be legal to use oils from the United States. In many other countries, oils can be used accepted for religious spiritual purposes. This is one movement of the globalization. There is another movement of globalization of oils. When year after year, thousands of tourists they visit the Peruvian, Colombian, uh, and Ecuadorian and Amazon for self-knowledge, spiritual growth, for healing, and probably some of them for exotic experiences. So this was the start. Uh, when I told this Dennis McKenna, of course he had the ideas with everyone, why he would agree with me, Dennis McKenna. He said, no, no, the globalization started when Louis published his part of the book, The Virus Provisions. Yes, yes, indeed. Every viral infection has an incubation period. And the inoculation happened at this event, 1971. So I still stick to my point. <laughs> so Louis Luna, as you can see, is among the number of one persons of this ISCO movement. He was the first one who organized an ISCO scientific conference. He discovered Pablo Marigo, so he gave to the world this uh, talented painter. And Louis was the first one who introduced in anthropology the concept of teacher plans uh, by his uh, doctoral dissertation. So I would like to introduce you to Eduardo Luna. You can hear them for at least 90 minutes. He will talk to us about Oyasco, the teacher plant, uh, the, yeah, teacher plant and healing curve of Amazon and some other Amazonas medicine. So, if you like. Okay, now I press this. Yes. Is it on or is this off? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, it is on now. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. All right, well, I'm very, very pleased to be here again in Debrecen. I was here some years ago, but I've been to Hungary uh, many times, you know, in fact. So, so uh, the first time, I think that it was at the end of the 70s, I crossed uh, Hungary on bicycle on, on the way to the Czech, uh, 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 Czechoslovakia at the time. Then I was here quite often in Budapest in the 80s, invited by Lajos Boglar, who was an ethnographer who organized meetings called the Indian Days. And then since I met uh, our friend, uh, Professor Ede Frexka, many times, you know, and I had been very, you know, privileged to have him in our home in, in Brazil many times, nearly every year. And we have been, I think our friendship goes back for 20 years, you know, so publishing together and so on. So very thankful for, 
for Professor Frexka for this invitation here. Okay, <clears throat> so he mentioned that I was born in Colombia and I was born here in Florence and this is the beginning of the, of the rainforest, you know, the eastern slope of the Andes, this town. This is probably, this photograph was taken when I was probably, I don't know, 12 years old. When I was born, there was no running water, there were no cars, there was, there was no uh, uh, electricity. So it was a quite, uh, it was nearly a missionary place you know, near the Amazon with a lot of indigenous uh, in Indians coming uh, to, uh, to, to the town. And my grandmother used to have a little shop where she was selling all sorts of things. And so I have seen the Indians since I'm a child. So, but uh, I left uh, Colombia when I was 18 and uh, uh, went to first to Spain. I, I studied in Spain, first in, in northern Spain. I was studying philosophy and one year of theology. Then I studied uh, in, 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 and then in Madrid University. But then after seven years away from my country, so I met Terence, uh, Terence McKenna. He was trying to get something, trying to order something in a very bad Spanish, so I came. And I said the magic sentence, may I help you? And that changed everything for me as well, you know, for both of us. You know. So I, in my long journey with ayahuasca and yaje, so I have always been in two different worlds. On one side, Terence McKenna, in America, uh, to travel the world, and then Don Apolinar, Yacana, Mijoy, who I knew since I was a child. And this was when I, more or less when I met him, 1971. So uh, Terence was at that time with Erika Nistel writing uh, this book, the, the Invisible Landscape. And so he stayed in our uh, little country house uh, near Florencia. This, is, this photo was taken many years later. This is my mother and my sister. And anyway, so uh, uh, this book was um, written with Dennis, his brother Dennis, uh, who we have been working together for many years. And uh, Terence was the first one who mentioned to me Yahé. I, my father, who knew about Yahé, never mentioned that because, you know, in, in, the, in the, at the at least at that time in the Colombian Amazon, you uh, Yahé is something of the Indians. It's some some very lower thing, you know. So. One is supposed to get a real education, and where is the education? You have to look to Europe, you know. So, so uh, Latin Americans very often know much better the, the European history and writers and art and all that than those of our neighboring countries. You know, we are not so interested in the other Latin American countries, Europe. You know, so, so but, uh, but my father knew about this, and uh, then we had a uh, uh, is the and a mixture of Panisteropsis capi and Diploptilus cabrerana. These two are vines of the Malpighia uh, family. So this is Yahé, not Ayahuasca. I will tell you the, the difference. So, Yahé was the first publication about Yahé came in 1963, about the letters between James Burke, uh, 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 William Morris, and Alan Ginsberg. Uh, but then, Years later, I became interested in ayahuasca. And ayahuasca is Banisteropsis capi plus another plant of the Rubiaceae family, it's a, the coffee family. And this is what has become more famous, the, this uh, combination. Now, here you see the, the area of ayahuasca, it's much larger than the area of Yahé. So, Yahé is in the area between Colombia, a little bit of Ecuador, and northern Peru. But ayahuasca is taken in a much larger area. So the vine, Banisteropsis cabi, contains three main alkaloids: harmine, uh, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine. And uh, the two plants, uh, both Diploptilus cabrerana and Cicotrevididi, it is contained the methyltryptamine. Now, probably all of you know, many of you are pharmacologists here also. Uh, dimethyltryptamine, it is not orally active. But then in the presence of harmine, harmine is an MAO inhibitor, then the, uh, the DMT 
travels uh, through the blame, uh, blood barrier and goes into uh, uh, serotonin receptors and so on. I will uh, leave uh, Dr. Fresca to tell us about the pharmacology. But uh, I met Terence in, in the 80s and he was uh, then in Vancouver working on his doctoral dissertation which is just the confirmation, uh, the hypothesis I think that it was Bo Homestead from, uh, uh, from uh, Stockholm, uh, from the Karolinsky Institute, the first one who proposed that this was the mechanism that was acting in the Yahe and Ayahuasca Bruce. But it was Dennis uh, uh, McKenna, Terence's brother, who uh, proved it in, in the lab. Now, go back to the meeting, you know, because, uh, because uh, uh, Dr. Frexer mentioned, you know, this meeting, you know, I never thought of it, never thought that this meeting that we had was the beginning of the ayahuasca globalization. But thinking about this, he, he, he is right. Why? Because, okay, I knew Apollinar since I was a child, but, you know, I didn't know much about Yahé or these things, you know, so I, I was educated, I was an Amazonian, educated in Europe. But then it was a German, Hans Mosler Helder, uh, who uh, had the contact with the Apollinar Yakanami Hoy. He had been taking Yahé with him and he gave us a brew and then turns Erika Mister, who answered. Erika, who is here, uh, took, uh, took it with us and Carlos, everybody called Carlos the Hungarian. Uh, uh, Hans, I talked to him just a, a, a few days ago, I telephoned, found <laughs> his telephone, he's still alive, and uh, he told me that he was Kalman, Kalman, you know, so, but now we have to find out, you know, who really this person was. Uh, he thinks that he's dead now, he must be over 80. Yeah. Anyway, so, so he was a Colombian, Amazonian, educated in Europe, two Europeans, in one America, taking the Okay, in 1973, I went to Berkeley, and then I started to, uh, I spent, okay, with Terence, I spent two months in Colombia, he was writing The Invisible Landscape, then in 1973, I went to Berkeley, uh, and I spent two months with him. Uh, very fruitful uh, months, because a lot of new publications have come out. For instance, uh, Hallucinogens and Shamanism by Michael Harner, who later wrote uh, The Way of the Shaman, became very uh, popular. Uh, Michael Harner, he had an experience with the uh, Chipibo Conibo, and, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, apparently this was the beginning for him of his career uh, uh, teaching Shamanism without any uh, plans or any substance. Then uh, uh, that year came out this book by Peter Force, uh, Flesh of the Gods. And here, this is really a very important book because suddenly, uh, for me, it was like the discovery that there was already a, a number of publications uh, about plants, uh, uh, hallucinogens, we'll call it the time, I don't like them to use the term any longer, you know, but let's say psychoactive plants or sacred plants, I prefer. And then uh, in the, the book by Peter Frost, there were all these pioneers, Richard Evan Schultes, who was the father of modern ethnobotany, who had written uh, hundreds of, really, of papers about different psychoactive uh, uh, plants. Uh, one of the books was with uh, Albert Hoffman, uh, Plants of the Gods. And uh, so he later became a mentor. So I, I spent some time in, in, in Berkeley, in, in Harvard University with him. Then uh, Schultes uh, was the, one of the first one together with uh, Weston Labar, who took peyote uh, in, in, the, in the, I don't remember what state it was, in, but anyway, in the United States. And Weston Labar wrote about the peyote cult. Uh, uh, Gordon Watson, another one of the uh, uh, authors of this book, famous for his article in Life magazine, where he wrote about Maria Sabina, and it was like the beginning of a huge movement in the States going to Mexico to, to, to try the mushrooms. Gordon uh, Watson wrote, of course, uh, the, the road to Elise, Eleusis, together with um, uh, Albert Hoffman and the Greek. In 1971 or 72, 
there was absolutely a, a, in, in anthropology a, a bombshell. It was written based only on conversations with one informant. Uh, Rancy was uh, showing him photographs of animals and plants, and then out of uh, this Agustin Guzman, who was a Barasana Indian living in Bogota, suddenly started to come the mythology of the, the, the different animals, and, and, and this book uh, was extraordinary. Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, Rancy Dormatov showed how, without referring to Banisteropsis Capi, to Yahé, it is for capi because these people didn't use any other mixed plant, just by the of capi and tobacco. It is without a reference to these plants, it's impossible to understand this culture because everything in this culture is around the plants the mythology, the narrative, even the art. So, okay, another great scholar is Johannes Wilbert, the work. Uh, specialist in tobacco. In tobacco, we have to understand that tobacco is not simply, the, you know, the cigarette you, you know, which in fact, you know, people uh, smoking cigarettes are not smoking tobacco. They are smoking tobacco with four or five thousand chemicals, you know, which is it's doing the damage, you know. But but the tobacco used, especially in the Amazon, is not uh, nicotiana tobacco. It's nicotiana rustica, very strong, and it produce it, it may produce uh, visions. And uh, in some uh, um, Amazonian tribes, the name for shaman is the tobacco, tobacco, the, the, the person who knows about tobacco. Okay, by the way, here is, uh, sorry, uh, uh, this is uh, Johannes Wilby to the right, Rashid Domatov, and Claude de Vistal, the famous French anthropologist today. And uh, another great scholar writing in this book is William uh, Emboden. Uh, wrote about uh, aquatic plants, especially in European plants, but also mushrooms and so on, still alive. And uh, uh, the Doc Shannon, who uh, was writing, uh, he discovered the uh, uh, curandero, a healer, who in the coast of Peru, using today uh, San Pedro cactus, uh, it contains a uh, uh, mescaline, but then uh, now we understand that the use of San Pedro cactus goes back in history also for thousands, thousands of years. I mean, here we, we have an example in the Chavin culture in, in Peru, uh, where in the main plaza, I don't know here, a, 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 a photograph, I forgot, but anyway, you have the, this figure of a shaman or, of, yeah, or a person uh, being transformed in the process of transforming into a jaguar with the with the San Pedro cactus in hand. This is about 2,000 years old. But then, uh, very recently, just a few months ago, I mean, August, yeah, August last year, uh, there was a, there was a discovery in uh, north of Lima. They discovered a, a, a dry San Pedro cactus in a, what seems to be a ritual uh, a space uh, and dried very carefully. You know, you will. It was not rotten, so it was carefully dried up. And, and so this uh, shows that the use of San Pedro cactus goes back at least 4,000 years. You know. So here we have, you know, I mean, uh, really the use of uh, uh, sacred plants in the, uh, in the Americas was thousands of years. This is another book that appeared uh, when I was in Berkeley. It is The Wizard of the Upper Amazon. And this is about the mestizo tradition. In the first time, this was a very embellished story about Manuel Cordova Rios, who was a healer in Iquitos, and uh, he told me, he told uh, 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 Bruce Lamb that he had been kidnapped by the Indians, and that in, in this process, he had been learning about ayahuasca and so on. So I have no idea, back in 1973, that I was going to study this tradition in the 1980s, you know. And uh, so this was the this book was there floating. Uh, no, the, it didn't have much consequences except for some connoisseurs. But anyway, and I want to mention here, although this was not published in 1973, it came many years later. But this is the work of uh, Manuel uh, Constantino Manuel Torre, Torres, who is the great specialist in Anadranthera uh, Anadranthera species, which is also very very important. In, in South America, not only in South America, but all the way into the Antillas. You know? uh, 
For instance, he is the he was among the, the archaeologists who uh, discovered that uh, this uh, this which was not known at all what it was. It is in fact a paraphernalia for the use of an adelantera colubrina. So, so the, uh, I don't have here the slide, but this is a this is a, 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 a snuff trail, and because they found in northern Chile, uh, uh, which is far from Titicaca Lake, you know, where it was the center of the Tiwanaku culture, but but it was influenced by the, the, the Tiwanaku culture, and they uh, they found in northern Chile, San Pedro de Atacama, which is one of the driest places on the planet, they found uh, hundreds of Packages I mean, of burials uh, dried out. Um, they they uh, uh, funerary bundles uh, in which uh, they were able to rehydrate these textiles and get them perfectly out. And they found that about 25 percent of the people had bags with the whole, you know, with a, a snow tray and the little spoon and the inhalator, etc. So found uh, so they he was able to find and. and and uh, Chilean archaeologists also, they were uh, able to discern that we cannot understand Tiwanaku culture, again, another big culture in South America, without reference to a uh, uh, psychoactive plant, which is another matter. Okay, so um, I went back in 1971, 73, I was in Berkeley. I wrote to Raisin Dolmatov, he advised me that I should study science, you know, so I was. Uh, doing my, 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 my work, and got into mathematics a little bit, and then in chemistry, and so on. And, but then in 1979, I got a job in Finland, and then I went, to, went back to, to Colombia after seven years. I, I made a trip uh, through South America, which uh, later I found out that it was nearly exactly the same way that Che Guevara with his famous motorcycle did, you know. So uh, I didn't know about this. So I came in 1979 at the end of my holidays, and then I went to Apolinar, I, you know, this Indian that I knew since I was a child, and then to Yahe for the second time. So it took me seven years from the first one to the second one. But all those seven years, I do, was doing my homework, reading as much as possible of these plants, and studying a little bit of this, you know. So, and uh, that was absolutely for me extraordinary, because, I mean, I. I I, one of the things that I realized, especially in that, uh, that ceremony, is that as, as an Amazonian, I have been all my life looking at Europe and not looking at all about, uh, uh, on my own people, you know? I mean, although I am mestizo, my father is partially Indian, my mother is more white, but, you know, I have completely disregarded, especially the epistemology of uh, uh, Amerindians. You know? So this was the discovery. And one of the things that I asked Don Apolina was, Don Apolina, why do you take Yahé? And he said, to see all those animals that are uh, out there. Which it was, uh, I didn't understand. Only later, you know, I began to understand how you take Yahé in order to see what is out there. You know? So, you know, with uh, Ede Fresca and Rick Strassman and uh, Slavic Vojtovic, uh, we wrote many years later, we wrote together a book, a book called Inner Pass to Outer Space. We will come to this at some point. Anyway, so Yahé um, and Ayahuasca used by many different indigenous tribes in the Upper Amazon. Upper Amazon is, you, know, you have the Rio Negro and the, and the, the Amazon River and Madeira, I don't know, the, well, and it's, it's a big triangle. And this is what we call it the Upper Amazon. And uh, when I was doing my doctoral dissertation, I found about 72 different indigenous tribes using Yahé or Ayahuasca. You know, so here I have the, okay, here this, this now, I don't know how. Uh, is it possible to make it darker? Or, I don't know. Uh, can you see well? Yeah. It's okay? So here you have the many. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I can. <laughs> Keep it in my hand. Uh, here you see the many different indigenous tribes. You know, I don't know if you can see it well. You know, using uh, Yahé and Ayahuasca, all these areas. So this is the this is the Upper Amazon. Although uh, uh, 
It is also found the marine triopsid in the lower Amazon, and in fact, I, I learned that the, but in the mouth of the Amazon there were Indian, indigenous people uh, selling ayahuasca to the Umbanda terreros, to the Afro-Brazilian religious. We'll come to that. Anyway, so, and here you have the, these are the, the indigenous uh, uh, tribes, you know, using yaje or ayahuasca, and in, in, in brackets you have the, the linguistic family. So, by, by the way, I don't know if you uh, know that uh, the Amazon is one of the richest linguistic areas in the world. You know? So it's uh, with many, many different uh, uh, languages from many different in, uh, families. You know? So, and many Amazonians uh, are plurilinguistics, learning, you know, because one of the ways to, if some, a man wants to have a wife, has to go somewhere, live there, for, and work for the father, or we bring the wife home, and then, and so like this, the kids are learning many different languages. But anyway, so many, many different uh, indigenous tribes using ayahuasca. And um, Rafael Kassen, a Finnish Swedish scholar, I, I thought in the beginning that I was, uh, he was a Swedish scholar, but then later I found, no, no, he was a Finnish scholar. Uh, who was uh, had a job in the Swedish School of Economics when I got a job, you know? So, so I I I, I had uh, his chair for 32 years. So he was uh, the pioneer, uh, as a ethnographer working in the in the in Peru, and, and sorry in Ecuador. He did his work uh, on the Shuar. He, by the way, he also was the one who discovered the whole process of of shrinking heads. You know, you have seen the. You know, the you know, so he was able to, you know, show the whole process with the different plants and so on to shrink the head. And it's very important when shrinking the head that you are able to recognize the person because you are supposed to get the spirit of that person and you have it with you and you insult the person and it's all only you. It's like a second, you know, self, you know, second spirit. And he was able to describe, um, uh, well, he was that he didn't, he never, never took yahe. Or not ten minutes ago, but anyway, he described uh, the, very well the ceremonies. Even he put it on, in, on, on writing and music, you know. So, so he was very talented. And based on his description, we have this uh, ceremony among them. And this is very interesting because you can see that this is perhaps the original uh, use of yaje and, and ayahuasca, uh, collective rituals where everybody, men and women. Uh, sometimes even uh, adolescents, uh, take part in the ceremonies with lights and, and it's a party, it's a party. I mean, it, it is a sacred party, but it is a party. You know, they dance uh, and uh, among the Cubeo is, is a party that takes three days, you know, so, uh, you know, dancing and you know, day and night, you know, drinking not only yaje, but uh, other things as well. And uh, the chicha, which is a beer, you know, made of mandioc and, and the wine from the palm and so on. So, but for many Amazonian Indians, drunkenness is sacred, you know? and, and it is take place in ritual. You know? So the, the same people, the, the same Indians who get, you know, gloriously drunk, you know, in ceremonies, they despise the white people who get drunk anytime, because for them it is ritual. <laughs> okay, so these are two of the books of uh, uh, Rafael Castell. And, he, uh, and this was uh, the one to the left was published after his death. Uh, but anyway, so they had had the same as Amazon. Uh, then Raisin Dolmatov, once he wrote this book, uh, Amazonian Cosmos, then he went to the Barasana. He was documenting the Barasana and the other Tucano and uh, uh, indigenous tribes in the Colombian Valdez. He was able to <coughs> document very clearly, uh, very carefully the whole process of preparation of yaje, and uh, one of the he con, uh, concise in this paragraph why the people take yaje among this uh, among, among the, the Tucano. So I'm going to read it here. Read it with me. Recognizing that the individual must pass from one dimension of existence or cosmic plane to another to communicate with the spirit or invisible world. The Tucano take capi you know, uh, to uh, to effect this transport. 
The tree represents to them the process of birth and breaking through the wall that separates the two cosmic planes and signifies, according to anthropological studies, the rupture of the placenta. Drinking cup is often interpreted as returning to the cosmic uterus, since they insist that they sometimes come to know death while under the influence of the drug. The Tugano consider the return to the cosmic uterus as an anticipation of death, which permits contact with the divinity or visitation with the source and origin of all things. And by the way, the name, uh, the word ayahuasca is Quechua. Aya means death, you know. So it's the vine of death, or the vine of the spirits, or the vine of the ancestors. So the, this idea of death is very important, and we will come to that. Raisel Dolmatov was, to my knowledge, the first or the second, perhaps, anthropologist who took a uh, yaje. And he did it only once, and he recorded the experience and published it in this book, The Shaman and the Yago. Now, um, very interesting, uh, um, the title of the book, because he um, um, learned that the importance of transformation, especially jaguar transformation, but also other great predators like the eagle, or the harpy eagle, or the anaconda, uh, in shamanism. So the idea of the shaman is able to transform into a jaguar. Of course, not transformed physically, but is able somehow cognitively to be able to get into that cognitive space of the jaguar, of all other plants and uh, animals, and become and see the world through the eyes of the jaguar. Now, this is, this is a very peculiar idea, but then we find it all over uh, 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 the Americas. So in Mesoamerica, Central America, and South America, you find this idea everywhere. So I have come to the conclusion that it is a radical epistemological approach. The Western approach is that you, you divide things into components. You get to the, you know, what is the, the, the elemental particle, let's say, you know, or whatever exists out there. For them, uh, knowledge is along, not only that, because they are, of course, perfectly capable, you know, they have great civilizations and so on, but they also is the approach of learning through identification with the object of what you are uh, studying. Identification so in such a way that the best way to learn about the jaguar or, or uh, is like becoming cognitively approaching that, you know, being a fish or being a serpent and so on, so traveling. But this idea you find it all over, inclu including the European shamanism. So, so this is not the alien idea, it's not the only. So the, the idea of transformation, you find it everywhere. I, I just brought just one more slide, because I could bring uh, you know, dozens of slides showing this idea of the, the shamanic transformation. This is from uh, the culture in Panama. You have, a, again, the transformation. This is like a, a, a monkey transformation. You find also different <coughs> uh, fish and so on. Okay, Reza Matov had the idea to go to the Barasana with um, paper and pencils of different colors and gave it to the Indians to see what they would do. And uh, so, and in the process of this, he realized that what they were doing, they were doing these kind of things. So he realized that all iconography in Monte Tucano, even body painting, is all related to the, uh, to the yaje or the capi experience. And this is, it has a certain meaning. I mean, this is, for instance, you know, that is the, the great um, uh, cosmic serpent surrounded uh, the, the Maloka. And you find this idea painted or somehow in many different tribes. Okay, so, and so he realized that all art among the Tucano and Barasana, uh, it is related to the visionary world. And uh, he also uh, uh, realized that in the process of becoming an adult, very important, drinking yaje and or capi, uh, they call it, uh, and uh, so that they will, they will be, uh, they take yaje, see, uh, you have the old shaman who is reciting the spiritual geography so that the kids are being led and they are able to see the myths. So, so one of the reasons to take it is 
that the kids will be able to see that the myths are real, that they are able to live the myths. I will come to that uh, at some point. Um, other anthropologists have uh, uh, discovered that uh, uh, the art, for instance, this is the Chipibo Indians in, uh, in Peru, that art is also related to the visionary world. So this is related to the ayahuasca experience. And the skirt of the, of the, of the, of the girls is also related to the, to the, to the experience. Uh, there's a German anthropologist uh, called Angelika Gebhardt who wrote a very beautiful article and, and also uh, her doctoral dissertation showing how uh, this uh, iconography, it is related to the songs that when the shaman takes a Natepe ayahuasca, goes into the spirit world, and then he can see and hear the spirits singing. And those songs, he sings with the spirits, and somehow the women are able to translate the song into some kind of pattern. So this is not, I mean, it's not a partiture, but it is musical somehow. And I, I was able to confirm that because I spent one month with the uh, Shipibo in the Santa Rosa de Pinococha in the Ucayali. I spent a month doing the diet, you know, what you are supposed to do and take ayahuasca. It's very hard. And at the end of the month, uh, he said, okay, now you are going back to Pucallpa. Now I'm going to put you a protection. So he was singing a song. And then I said, okay. So when he finished, I said, what is this song? And he took one of these, uh, uh, Skirt, they said, I'm putting this on you. So they have the idea that these songs are like some sort of protection, or they, they have the, 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 the idea that all people are surrounded by some kind of three dimensional, you know, let's call it aura of some sort. And illness is the distortion of this aura. And in this culture, all the healing is through songs. But I was interested in collecting plants, and I asked Don Apolinero, Basilio, what, where are the plants that you are using? He said, if you know the song of the plant, you don't need the plant. So only if you forget the song of the plant, then you have to go back to the, to the, to the plant. You know? So it's a completely different way of you know, dealing with you know, cognitive. Uh, uh. Jean Landon, an American anthropologist living in Florianopolis, she was working in with the Siona in Colombia, and she also came to the conclusion that all the art of the Siona in the narrative is as well related to the uh, visions they have in the spirit world. Now, I was interested, what happens, I mean, they take the brew, and what happens, is it individual trip or it is a collective trip? And uh, Jim Lando came to the conclusion that it is a collective trip, one, if you have a certain common cosmology, everybody knows that, okay, we have, you, you have a picture of the world, then the shaman say, okay, tonight we are going to take Yahe, and we are going to the second uh, uh, river, uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the second heaven, and the third river, for instance. And then they take Yahe, and they go to this place, and there are certain songs, which will relate to that world and certain spirits that appear and this spirit have a certain uh, body painting and so on. So, uh, Jin says, the Yahya experience is not one of individual random visions or free associations of the unconscious while under the drug's influence. It is rather an ordering of the used visions into culturally meaningful symbols and experiences, those gaining increasing control over the vision and events occurring, gaining increasing control over the, over the visions. So that's a, a very important concept. Okay, uh, so uh, I will show you some of the plans being used. Uh, I came to the conclusion, really, that it is impossible to understand the so-called new world you know, of the other. You know, 1492, they were not one old world and, and, and a new world. You know, there were two old worlds got into collision and created this new world that we are living. But in the, in the, in, in the uh, Americas, so many different plants were used. Huge knowledge of plants. But we have to see the knowledge of these plants within the context of great knowledge of plants in general and ways of, of dealing with, you know, uh, cultivating in different ecosystems 
and ways of treating the soil and so on. So much more than in the in, in Eurasia. And of course in Eurasia there were also plants were used, we know perfectly well, you know, uh, uh, mandrake and, and belladonna and henbane and, and opium, which was originally from Germany, and, 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 and cannabis and so on. But uh, the knowledge of these plants was practically destroyed completely because of the persecution, the witches. The witches' hunt was to a great extent a persecution against female shamanism that was found in Europe, and I'm sure you know here in Hungary there were also persecution of the shamans and so on, you know, because they had knowledge of this plant that could change your uh, your your, um, uh, your state of consciousness. Okay, in uh, 1980, I would, I wanted to do a film about Apollinar. Unfortunately, he died before I returned to Colombia. And uh, so I, I gather uh, friends, uh, borrow, uh, let me a, a Bolex camera, and then I have 30 hours of recordings and so on. And I went to, to Iquitos, and where I met Don Emilio Andrade Gomez, this man, and uh, who became, and this is an old photo that he gave me when he was young. And uh, so uh, I made a film about him, and you, you can find the film if you want. On YouTube, you know, you just type Don Emilio and his little doctors in my name, and you'll find it. Somebody put it there. The subtitles are not very good, but anyway, it's there. You know, but uh, I think that this is the first. I think this is the first film on Ay ayahuasca. I think that there was something about Yahé earlier, but I think on ayahuasca, it is the first film, and it was. Uh, I did it in 1980, and it was came in Finnish television in 1981, and then Spanish television in Mexico. Uh, so, and I recorded very carefully the whole process of preparing ayahuasca, that is the, uh, uh, the vine and the leaf of Cicotrebididis, uh, rubias. And then I got stuck in Peru and Brazil, you know, so I continued working uh, on ayahuasca. Uh, it was more, more difficult for me, even uh, being a Colombian, to study Yajé, because the whole area, the area where I was born, and in, in, the, the, in the Colombian Amazon, it was in the hands of guerrilla and narco traffic, and, uh, and, uh, and you know, so very dangerous and possible for some young guy to go there. You know, it will not last long. So, so this is a little bit of video, and I, I did. Uh, I was not only documenting what he was doing, but I was also participating in the ceremony as methodology. So that, so I thought that, and I think that I was the first anthropologist to use taking the blue as part of the fieldwork, you know, systematically, not only watching, you know, what they were doing, but doing it myself. And so, and I became very interested, and this is another friend, uh, uh, Don, uh, Don Emilio's uh, friend, Jose Corral, who was also my teacher for a while, and this is a slide that uh, Dennis uh, McKenna just presented recently in, in Guasilalca in, in, in Brazil. He took this photograph of uh, of Jose in '99. He died 102 years old, and I was scared of that famous for living long lives, you know. <clears throat> so I was documenting the whole process of you know the ideas of health, and illness, and so on, collecting plants. Uh, they were identified, and he came with this very important idea uh, that uh, he said that ayahuasca is only one of the many plant teachers. You know, so uh, he, he used to say ayahuasca is a doctor, is a doctor, but they are all the doctors as well. And so uh, I realized that uh, that there are many different plants that they, they consider as teachers. Sometimes they take them by themselves, sometimes they put it in the ayahuasca brew to study the properties, and in their view is to get in touch with the spirit of that plant. The plant will present to you, to you and will show you what, are you what the plant is for. So there is some kind of transmission of knowledge, you know, from the plant into, into the shaman. So. so these are some of them. Uh, I think that I collected something like about 70, 
I'll make sure plans of ayahuasca, but now we know at least 200. And perhaps the, the number is open and then, because it is simply a method of investigation of the properties of other plants. So, so they will put it, you know, anything you can put it there and see how it, it affects the, the vision and the, and the effects in general. So here we have Rumancia, tobacco, very important. Uh, I told you that uh, uh, tobacco is a very important shamanistical plant. Brugmansia, uh, uh, they contain atropine alkaloids. Uh, this was uh, plant was called earlier um, uh, Datura arborea, you know, related to Datura with atropine alkaloids, and you know many other plants. Caliandra pentanda that contains tetrahydrohormine, one of the alkaloids present in the vine, and so on. So many different plants. But then later on, I found that. Uh, uh, it, it, it was published a little, little bit after my, 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 uh, the first article that I wrote about plant leeches. And then Jean-Pierre Chomet, a French anthropologist working with the Yawa, he came to the same idea, you know, that uh, the, the plants are the only path of knowledge. He wrote uh, uh, the L'Unique Chemin de la Connaissance, the only path of knowledge. So this idea is among the Yawa in Colombia, but I found uh, some years later the same idea when I was doing field work in Colombia, in the Segundo Valley, in the Portumayo area, uh, 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 I was working with this uh, uh, Kamsa uh, Indian, and uh, he said, I was interested in the garden, you know, how the distribution of the plants, what plants are there, collecting plants, and then he said, this is the garden of science. So the same idea, the plant teaching, so it's a garden of science. So, so you learn, with this plant you, you learn. So it's there, you, you used to say, you know, this is our university. You learn from the plants. Much, many years later, just recently, uh, uh, I got in touch with this uh, student who is working for his doctoral dissertation in Oxford University, there was a day, and he said that plants are considered to have personhood have soul that can detach from the physical component of the plant, which of course remains rooted in the earth, in order to roam the tripartite cosmos. As powerful agents, these plants can move, speak, protect, even kill. In this sense, as I came to understand, plants are or can be volitional subjects occupying phenomenology, phenomenal perspectives of the world. So they have this idea that the plants have also cognition. They are able, you know, to uh, and communicate. So, okay, uh, Jeremy Larry, who has been writing about, about uh, intelligence in nature, you know, he wrote, in my view, the perspective of science and indigenous knowledge could both be true at the same time and could even be combined to produce a deeper understanding of the living world. Now we know more and more papers, more and more books are coming, and, you know, uh, but also philosophical book like this one, Plants as Persons. You, this idea of plants as person is not unique to the Amazon. It's you know it's, you find in other in other places as well. So anyway, so I, I finished my I, I was doing field work in Peru for several years, several summers, and then it was the my, my doctoral dissertation that was published in Stockholm and then also in Czechish. You know, much better edition in Czechish than in English. But anyway, so I I, I think that I mentioned that we have to see the knowledge of plants, psychoactive plants, in the Americas within the context of the huge knowledge of many other different plants, including food, uh, food plants. You know, I mean, I just you know, put two slides. You know, that as you know, I think that about 60% of the food today, or even perhaps even more, that we eat in the world, it has been the domesticated by Amerindians. So we have to think of the plants within this much larger context and huge knowledge, you know, I mean, they have laboratories, you know, of, of, of uh, 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 different uh, uh, gradients and, and studying different soils. And if you go to Machu Picchu, some areas, you, you can see that there are really laboratories of, of, of plants. And uh, I, I have only a couple of, of slides. And even in the Amazon, uh, we have this idea that the Amazon was, uh, is, was a primitive, uh, I mean, the people, primitive cultures compared to Mesoamerica, with, you know, the Mayas and the, and, and, and the Aztecs, and, and then, or, or we think of, of the Andes, the Tiwanaku culture, and the, 
Chavín and then later, much later, the Incas and so on. So the Amazon was like a, like a black spot there, you know. But now they're finding, the archaeologists in the last 10, 15 years, that the Amazon was extremely rich. Apparently, could have had a population of 20 million people living there. And areas like this one, taken from the plain, uh, that indicate the use of uh, cultivation and uh, uh, in the area that uh, the anthropologists thought that there was not enough protein in the Amazon, but no, it's not true. They have the ways to, to, to cut, uh, catch fish also the, and, and keep the fish for the, for the dry season and so on. So channels, and now they're finding hundreds, hundreds of these, they call it geoglyphs all over the place. Uh, and so, so, so the Amazon was extremely advanced in many ways. Uh, we find, uh, we, we know it through the, some of the ceramics, especially in the Santa Ana area here in Brazil, and the, the, the spectacular ceramics in the mouth of the Amazon. You know, these are, they were not at all primitive people. They were highly sophisticated people, high culture, and huge knowledge pharmacology pharmacological knowledge, because they were surrounded by thousands of plants. It's thought that in the Amazon there are perhaps 80,000 species of higher plants, and an Indian is able to identify hundreds of them. You know. uh, when, when you're working with the Indian, they're eating all the time, you know, because they know a little bit of this, little this and that, you know. And the same place where the Indians were starving, dying of hunger, you know, the Indians are surrounded by food, you know, because they, they know so many different species. And in the Amazon you find the best soil in the world. Hard to believe it, you know. Uh, the terra preta do Indio, the, this, uh, this uh, black soil, it is anthropogenic. It is made by, in, by human beings in a, a very uh, complicated process that they have not found uh, out, the scientists, yet, you know, all the details. Uh, it was to a great extent done by a, 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 burning uh, plants without oxygen so that you produce car charcoal, but charcoal that it is not reduced to, to, to ashes, but it, it, it exudates oils and the microorganisms live there. So this is really a living, living soil and it can be two meters deep so that they can cultivate again and again and again. And it is calculated that if you put together all the black soil in the Amazon, it will be uh, the area of the whole of France. So it's huge. So you could really uh, uh, feed uh, millions of people. When uh, uh, Jean-Marie de la, la Condamine went to the Amazon in the 18th century, he said, oh, but you know, there are very few people living here. So the, the Amazon seems to be part, uh, sparsely populated. But of course, what happened in the Amazon was exactly what happened everywhere in the Americas. Huge uh, uh, demographic loss. This is just an, an example from the Valley of Mexico, where you have in 1518 about 25 million people, and then in 1623 only 700 uh, left. So, and it is calculated that if we take it in the totality of the Americas, between 95 and 98 percent of the population die out with 150 years of contact. So, it is the greatest uh, you know, loss that we have had. Because it's, it's, it's like two completely different experiments. Think that the, the Americas and Eurasia, they were separated for thousands of years with completely different flora and fauna in many cases, and different cultures, and we just lost whole experiment. We lost probably one third of the population, or perhaps one fourth of the population of, of, the, of the Earth, of, of the planet at that time. In, in So, another, uh, uh, when I was uh, uh, finishing my field work uh, with Don Emilio and so on, Dennis McKenna, uh, we were collecting plants for a botanical garden in Hawaii. And then he said, I met this guy who is very strange, but it seems interesting. And so I went to see this man, Pablo Amarindo. Uh, he knew uh, very much about the plants. Uh, he had been in, a, in Ayahuasquero himself, but he said that he didn't. Uh, take ayahuasca any longer, but he showed uh, us some paintings, you know, with cheap paper, some aquarelles uh, depicting the, the, the plants and animals. And I, I noticed that he had very good memory. And I said, 
you know, you, you remember very well the, the plants and where, where the animals are living and so on, you know. He said, I remember everything I have seen. Yeah. This eidetic memory. And then I asked him, can you, do you remember the visions you had when you were taking ayahuasca? I said, yes, I, I do. So this was the first vision, uh, his first vision. And I was, of course, amazed, you know, because this is not at all the indigenous, like the Shipibo or the Tucan and so on. This is uh, uh, completely different. And, and all these beings, you know, what is this? And what is this? And what is this? It's a flying saucer. And, well, here you have the, the hot for there taking the room. You, you have the patient here, you have the mosquito net. Here the room taking the... So, so I got it, went back to Finland, took a photocopy of it, and then I asked him, what is this, what is this, what is this? To my surprise, had a whole description, I mean, I'll do a little bit, of the whole description of the painting. So I realized, goodness, this is a, a mine, gold mine. Because then I continue asking think, uh, uh, questions. I started to, uh, went every summer to Tucalpa, brought him the best quality paper and the best brushes and the best paint. And he started, you know, to, uh, to produce these extraordinary uh, visions, always with a description. You know? So I was asking, what is this? So, so gradually, I mean, he made the, when, during the time that, that I was working with him, about 200 different paintings with the description, the names of the, of the plants, the names of the spirits and so on. And for instance, this is one of them. This is, uh, these are the three great serpents that they, they believe that there are three serpents who are the mothers of the realms, the, the water realm, the, the jungle realm, and the uh, sky realm. So there are three uh, serpents. This is the Sacha Mama, this is the Yaku Mama, this is the Wild Mama. And one of the th uh, themes that you find in the Amazon is that the Yaku Mama, or the Great Serpent, can take, the sh uh, can take the form of a boat or a submarine or something like that. But then through this painting and then talking to Pablo, I realized that, the, uh, that there are a lot of sites in the Amazon of flying saucers of some sort, you know, here. And so the, and, and Pablo said, ah, oh, yeah, this is a transformation of the of this uh, serpent, the wild mama. But he said, but these are not machines. These are not machines. These are beings from another dimension that they manifest themselves like this. <laughs> okay. so, and so we put together this book, 1991, Iowa's Commission, published in Berkeley. Okay, after uh, uh, spending some time working with Pablo, and they, we created a school of painting and so on for several years, then I turned my attention to the Brazilian phenomenon. I got a job in a, a university, a federal university in Florianópolis, in southern Brazil, and then I started to study the uh, Brazilian phenomenon. Uh, there were several master theses uh, on Raimundo Irineo Serra, the founder of the first one, and there was also one article, uh, uh, and then I think one master thesis about this one. This one had never been studied, so I thought, okay, so I want to study this tradition. So this is in, in the uh, in the Brazilian Amazon, in the area of Acre and Rondonia. So the the beginning of the of this it took place here in the uh, uh, in Rio Branco. In this area, the first uh, of the religion, the Santo Daime, and then later in the 60s, uh, well, in the 30s and the 40s, and then in the 60s, uh, in, a new religion emerged here in Porto Bello. So, in, in all these cases, uh, these religions were uh, uh, influenced by the Afro Brazilian religion because there was a huge migration from the uh, Brazilian northeast into the Amazon. Uh, in the 40s, in the 30s some, but in the 40s, because um, Brazil took part in the, in, the, in the Second World War on the side of the Allies, and because, they, uh, as you know, the Japanese have taken Southeast Asia and taken all the, cul the cultivation of rubber, which was stolen from the Amazon by the British and, and took it to, to, to in the, in, in, Southeast Asia, the Japanese took that and then they needed desperately, the Allies needed rubber. Because without rubber, no tanks, you know, no, you know, you need it for, 
for the war as well. So, uh, so, so Brazil sent people from the Northeast to work as rubber tappers. So this is the, 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 the founder, the founder of the Santo Daimler religion, Raimundo Ireneo Serra, very tall guy, he was like something like two meters high. The Amazonians are small, so he was a giant there. And, uh, and he had a, a took ayahuasca with a, a Peruvian ayahuasca, had a vision of the Virgin Mary appear to him, and then he created a new religion. And, uh, and so this is the Santo Daime religion. Uh, nowadays they have, uh, uh, I don't know how many thousands of followers, and they are in 30, more than 30 countries including the United States. And here in Europe, I know of uh, uh, followers in Spain and, uh, and uh, Holland and uh, in Germany and so on. So, so they're small groups, but still, you know, active. And they have managed, you know, to, in some cases, to legally import the ayahuasca from Brazil for the same. <laughs> So they, they are now divided into four main uh, uh, churches or religious organizations. But even these four now they are again, you know, branching out. So I don't know how many people will be taking ayahuasca in the religious context uh, today. In Brazil, thousands. I don't know. It's difficult. I I I, I sent a message recently to one of the uh, um, leaders of the Santo Daime. He's a friend, he a, was a writer, or he's a writer and, and a leader of this church, asking him how many, you know, so I, I haven't got the answer, but I can imagine there must be something like 30, 40,000, or perhaps even more people taking regularly ayahuasca. So this is the Barquinha church that I studied, and uh, very interesting, extremely um, influenced by the Afro-Brazilian religion. In fact, this, this religion is a, it's a in syncretism of many different sources. So you have the sacrament from the Amazon, you have a, 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 a Kardecism, which is a, a, a religion created from the works of uh, Alain Kardec, is a, I don't remember his French name, it was a, a French who created the spiritualist, the spiritualist movement in France, and there was one Portuguese who brought it, uh, took it to Brazil, and now there are six million people. Cardassis, uh, but also Umbanda, uh, Candomblé, and then European uh, esotericism. So it's just a mixture of, of all things. And of course, for an anthropologist, I mean, it's a fantastic, you know, uh, to be able to understand, uh, understand uh, see all this. Uh, of course, popular Catholicism is very, very uh, important. So they have ceremonies that last for four hours, from eight to twelve in the church, they sing hymns. It's all very Catholic with Mary and, 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 and the different saints, but part of the altar, you see this as well. So these are entities <laughs> from the Afro-Brazilian religion. Incredible, you know, that this is also sacred. The mermaids are part of the religion as well as black slaves and so on. So this is extraordinary. And then after midnight, they go into the terreiro, ayahuasca again, and drum and dance. You know, it's just incredible. So, uh, you know, we don't have the time, but I have some footage. You, know, you would be amazed. Yes, uh, I I, I spent a long time uh, with them, uh, recording the ceremonies. Went with them to the field, and this is only just one plant, six hundred kilos, one ayahuasca plant. So. And then I, 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 I went to the different religions, sometimes uh, very interesting experiments, like I went with a, a friend from the UDB, which is another the Santo Daimler religion, and they have the ceremony, the ceremony there and so on, and this is the UDB, and not yet another uh, religion, uh, which is the one that managed to get it uh, in the United States perfectly legal. They went all the way to the Supreme Court and, and, and one. So this is the uh, UDB religion. I, I can, I don't have time to go into this. And Dennis McKenna uh, I, and I, we were invited to a conference there. Uh, I thought uh, 
when I was doing my, my diet and all this, you know, I said, we have to do a pharmacological study of ayahuasca. And, but then when we went to this conference with the UDB, they said, okay, let's do it. Fortunately, I could not, I, I could not do it myself, take part because I was teaching. But then Dennis McKenna, together with other friends, did a, a, a pharmacological study uh, of the UDB, coming to extraordinary conclusions. I mean, absolutely, there is no toxicity in ayahuasca. Uh, the people uh, taking part in these ceremonies, you know, better psychologically profiled than the controls. Kids take ayahuasca since they are in the womb of their mothers, no damage of any kind, you know. So, so, so really came to the conclusion, and very good uh, health, you know, health, you know, so in general. So, so there is no, uh, no problem at all, there is no toxicity in ayahuasca. So this is the, the study they made, took the blood samples and so on, and, and published in, in excellent results. So, okay, um, in October last year, uh, this book came out. This is the, uh, the second edition of Ayahuasca Reader, uh, which uh, Stephen White and I put together. We gather uh, indigenous myths, uh, encounters with the brew, by anthropologists, by botanists, by different scientists also. We publish some of the hymns of the churches and so on. And, uh, and in the, this last edition, we had also uh, um, a Hungarian contribution, tracking the river of change and dimensional interpretation of ayahuasca healing by the heart. Hungarian ethnobotanical ayahuasca research. So, is one of the uh, art, uh, chapters in, in the book, like uh, many, there are 50, over 50, so. Okay, in, the, in, the, in this book I wrote for the first time, I'm there to write, I always have been writing about, they do, they say, they, you know, whatever, always they, you know, putting myself outside, also to protect myself because, you know, in academic circles, you know, taking these kind of things, you know, they are, you know, so, but then, okay, I retire now, I don't have anything to lose, they cannot find me from any place. So, so I wrote the chapter about my own, you know, a phenomenological study of what happens, you know. So, to me, so one of the things that I, I saw is recurring motifs. You know, for instance, I see very often the city, but this is a common motif also uh, among the Indians, incredible. Uh, when Andrew Whale was in Colombia, in the Segundoy Valley, he heard one of the Indians saying, tell, uh, saying to the other, let's see cities, instead of taking, let's take viaje, let's see cities. So, uh, city motive is something that I see very often. Uh, now, beings coming to me, giving me presents, uh, things, you know, that I don't understand what they are, but they are like, like, uh, I got into this world and they're very interested in they're coming, you know, to, to me, you know, and so, so what does it mean? A, 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 a world interconnected, you know, a, a both a horizontally, you know, going into different worlds with different beings in different places, but also sometimes also uh, perpendicular, going to uh, other places. Um, I very often go into the underworld, you know, this is my specialty. So, in horrible places, you know, but, you know. Okay, um, very often these beings come and approach me and they give me food and drink, you know. And my teacher, Don Emilio, told me, you never, you never drink or eat anything in the spirit world. So I always refuse it, but the more I refuse, the more they insist that I have to drink it, you know, you know, so. So, uh, uh, I'm, because they are coming to me, I'm curious to see what do they see in me, how, you know, if they're, you know, always the, the problem is, do they exist or is it just a projection of my own projection and so on. So, I'm trying to find a mirror so that I can see myself in this world, but it's always like a joke, you know. I see a mirror, and the mirror is pointing in a different direction, you go there and you go like that, or in something discovered, and I've never been able to see my own reflection, you know, so, and it has been going on for years. You know? So, I see very often ants, you know, and I don't know what is the meaning of these ants. I thought in the beginning they were like invaders of this world, but then I can see that they are also leading to other places, so, so I've been following them, and I go to very interesting places, you know, like showing me 
In, uh, in other instances, the ants are like pets for the spirits. Another time, you know, they are like hanging from like threads, you know, with ants or leaving a mark into this other world. You know, so, I don't know what to make of this. Now, I'm all, this is over for me, very good, you know, because I was years, you know, that I was going into this cockroach world, you know, which is so boring. You know, just, you know, little feet like that, you know, and, uh, you know spending hours looking at these things, you know. So, so it was very boring. But now, I, uh, apparently, this, this is all you know. I have had experimented attacks, you know, that, that they come, some kind of, you know, with many arms and, and so suckers and you know, coming to me. And in the beginning, I was just like, you know, but now I learned that, okay, you know, it doesn't matter. I, I should not be afraid. So they come, you know, very close, and then gradually dissolve, and then I can go to more interesting worlds, you know, like different places. But I have to conquer the fear. You know, not to not to be afraid, let it happen, and then go there. So, so in a way, I'm learning that that you know, the conquering the fear, you know, is, is very important. You know, just to you know, become and and, and, and see. Uh, so, and I'm thinking, okay, how does this work? You know, Jean Landon said that the 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 Siona, they go to different places. You know, they are going to visit. Uh, places with different songs and with the, the spirit coming with. So, so how do you build these kind of things? And I, I came to the conclusion, you know, one, one of the is that once you pay attention into an element in this world, then it's more likely that it will happen again. And it seems that like you are able to somehow create your own idiosyncratic world, you know. So I already created this city with these ants and these spirits and all that. And so perhaps it just I'm doing it, you know, and it's me, you know, all the time. <laughs> so, so and so sometimes I ask these beings, you know, okay, where are you? You know, they answer right here. <laughs> or who are you? And they answer, we are you. <laughs> so, so this is all very mysterious. So uh, one of the things that uh, ayahuasca noticed that. Uh, I told you that how how they, they use uh, to induce the visions or the, the stories, the, the myths uh, in the kids. And a Belgian anthropologist wrote about the Kashinawa uh, the following, and an informant told her, you have to remember a myth before you drink the brew. If you concentrate well on the story, the story and its being will appear to you in vision and you will understand the meaning this story has for your own life and experiences. You will feel the story, you will live it. And I'm, I'm you know, wondering, you know, I think that this, the power of the imagination, you know, some, sometimes I, I take the brew, I see this, I, I am in a more or less boring place, nothing interesting happening, and I just think of a concept, let's say flower, and then flowers begin to appear. I don't know which flowers, but flowers come, or water, or lake, or animal, so, so this happened. So I think that, that this somehow helps you to manipulate your own imagination. So, so that, that I think that we are, we are much more imaginative than we think, you know. Uh, we may think, oh, I don't have so much imagination. But in certain circumstances, it just, you know, pour it out of you. So this is one of the things, you know, that, that may happen. And very interesting artists. Uh, uh, Taking ayahuasca and then, and then create this uh, extraordinary world. This is a, a Brazilian. Okay, so I, I'm going to uh, stop here because uh, uh, Professor Frex is going to talk about the pharmacology of ayahuasca. But today, just today, this morning, I got a message from Jordi Riva from Barcelona that this paper has just been accepted for publication. Assessing the psychedelic after blowing ayahuasca uses post acute neurometabolic and functional connectivity changes are associated with enhanced mindfulness capacity. This is another avenue uh, for healing, you know. Uh, that after taking the brew, very often, I mean, in a normal drug, let's say, you take a drug and the next day you feel horrible, you know. I mean, take, uh, you go to get drunk, and, you know. You're... With ayahuasca, it's the opposite. Is you take it and next day you feel so very peaceful, and more mindful, more easy to meditate, more calm, and all this. And I think that the, the, the therapeutic uh, uh, 
possibilities are huge. And there are many, I, I, I didn't put, uh, but there are many papers now coming out uh, which shows that this and other uh, plants like uh, mushrooms, like for instance, uh, psilocybin and even the substances, can be uh, enormous uh, uh, therapeutic potential. So, okay. So I think that I go over here. Ah, okay, just, 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 just <laughs> this is my last thing, you know. You know, I've been wondering again, because once you begin to, to take these things, you begin to question philosophy. I mean, what is all about? You know, as we all know, Descartes, he said, he divided everything into rex cogitans, which is the mind, and rex extensa, which is something that you can measure, the typical dualism. I think that there must be something in between. <laughs> uh, just, uh, you know, somehow that it is you, but it's not you, it's there, but, you know, so, I think. Okay, so, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I mean, as a, as a ethnographer, you know, I, I about this, you know, the, the concept of plant extinctions, and uh, there are other anthropologists who have been saying this. But on the other hand, biologists now are working also on this idea. For instance, Stefano Mancuso he wrote uh, this book, Bright Green, which I recommend. And, uh, you know, and, you know, Pollock, uh, Michael Pollock, and, uh, and there are others, you know, so, so I think that bio biologists, you know, begin to think that there is something out there. And it's a very good question, because I wish to address it in my very brief time, just a couple of sentences, that plant features, original name, uh, is scholarly, Yeah, well, I mean, I have myself, I've been collecting for 20 years now, um, uh, statements, you know, you know hundreds. And uh, all the, part of this material is now in the hands of a student who is working for his doctoral dissertation at the California Institute of Integral Studies. You know, with the, with the program, he's making some sort of database, you know, of themes, you know. So, so, yeah. Uh, he said uh, recently, you know, we are going to a conference on entities, you know, he sent me a good file about encounter with entities by people from many, many different countries. So I think that, you know, at the moment we can do this, you know. Uh, now, how scientifically can you work with something that is so subjective, you know. So there is no way that you can, the only thing it would be statistical, you know, that, so more often than not. Than not but, Scientifically, I don't know, but I will leave this to to Dr. Fresca. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. More, more questions. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the reason behind the advice not to drink or eat anything in the lower <laughs> I don't, I don't know, but but you you find that idea in a lot of mythologies, in a lot of folk tales, and all you know. 
I mean, uh, okay, I give you the list because I know it of, you know, of heart. Original sin, Adam and Eve, why they got into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Second, Greek mythology, Persephone, why she got hooked up in the underworld and her mother, who had good times in the underworld. Uh, it was very difficult to come up with a deal with Hades, and part of the deal, she must stay down half a year in Hades and half a year upstairs. Uh, Hansen and Becca, why they got into trouble? They were in the candy house. There was two movies uh, recently, the Hans Labyrinth, why the little girl went into trouble when she was born. Don't touch the table, don't eat nothing from the table, and the monster is the eyes. And, the... and there was another Japanese uh, animation movie, Shiriko's Dream. Speak it away. Speak it away, the other. Yeah. Yeah. Hungry little Shiriko's dream. Uh -huh. So the little girl has to save her parents who would hook up in the spirit where they were driving to swines because they ate. So the answer, oh, I don't know, but it's just look at this. And anyone who knows other tales means, please give it to the database. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just okay. in case, I, I don't need them. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, my question is, uh, in this lecture, uh, you talked about the personal experience uh, consuming DMT in the form of ayahuasca, but have you ever uh, tried the DMT uh, in the form of like, smoking, like in crystal or changa, or is it a different spiritual effect for you? <laughs> That is a personal question. <laughs> and uh, if it is personal, you know, it's not public. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, I give the answer, you know. So our Ayahuasca experience, we try to bring this idea about that it has some lessons, teaching behind it. So how can you observe an environment if you are in a rocket compared to a local train? Ayahuasca DMT is a local train, you can, you can sit, look around, observe, <laughs> but you, you are shooting to the stratosphere by a rocket, you know what you can learn. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah, fine, guys. Do you know any bad experience of use of the use of Ayahuasca? Okay, well, yes, I, I heard the story, but what happens is that with this, it's becoming so popular, and unfortunately, there are too many people conducting sessions without much training. You know, it's just like getting into an, air, an airplane with a pilot that has very few hours of, of you know, experience. You know, I would not get into that plane. You know? So, so, so. Yeah, I mean, mostly the problem is not is not a toxic. I mean, it's not a physiological problem. A psychological, you know, if you have it in a right, good setting with a person who is experienced, no problem. The problem is doing it in the wrong setting and with people who, you know, are not prepared or do not have good intentions. Unfortunately, they happen. You know, people who are more into the... I, I used to say that the greatest danger of ayahuasca is not physiological, it's not psychological, it's the ego, ego inflation. That is, suddenly you say, oh, now I can do, now I can help other, other people, now I can make money, you know, doing this and that, you know, and people with very little training in the Amazon. In order, you have to keep the diet, you have to be in isolation, you have to go through a lot of things, you know, so, you, so, so, uh, training, training, you know, so that is what is very important. You can hear it frequently, you can read on the internet, oh, I was on an ayahuasca ceremony and ayahuasca told me I am a shaman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Typical. So, after the similar experience, we coined the term ego trip. Ego trip, when you can feel that it's a projection of the ego and not the projection of the inner self. Uh, so many experiences uh, really 
than your inner self and reveals itself. But this kind of experience, you know, I am shaman, and, uh, oh, I am the universe, I am the creation, this has some touch of the ego. And, uh, and, and how do you know if an oil store or other psychedelic experience, which was even in the right certain setting, is ego trip or not? Very simple. The question is, what's the lesson? What's the lesson? If Ayesha tells you, you can be a healer if you go and fast for one year and it tells you how much others training you want to go through, which really a shaman doesn't turn this way, you know, there is a very arduous training behind it. Well, actually, you know, there are rare exemptions than some psychically talented, but that's rare. So you see, ego inflation and I would like to add, it's very important to know, sometimes you can hear on the internet that you got intoxicated during Goyaska session or before it, after that. You must absolutely be clear what do they mean on that ayahuasca. Because uh, many ceremony leaders, they mix these two components, what Louis showed you, with other components. For example, tobacco, nicotine, very toxic. Datura, very toxic. So if for them ayahuasca this is not the component, it starts to be unsafe. So that pharmacological safe ayahuasca is basically the copy with psychotherapies or diplotherapies. Anything goes into it, it can be risky. So when Yuli Louis said that pharmacology is safe, just it goes to the new component group. Uh, otherwise, just semi-jokingly, if you really took the, uh, these two components and the DMT in it, uh, I make it as a joke, but there is something behind it, DMT has less side effects than air. Wow! You know, you heard about holotropic breathing, when people they have forced uh, breathing exercise, you cannot go there with glaucoma, you cannot go there with epilepsy, uh, or what else? Uh, no, bron 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 asthma is contraindicated. There is no such contraindication in DMT. But if someone who has a very weak cardiac condition, yes, it can be very serious for them because of the emotional burden. Because oil cause sometimes can lead to the participant a very hard emotional journey and you know poor cardiac condition as it can be dangerous. So there are risks. And if the setting set in, right set setting not right, there is no good reintegration. Reintegration is an after process and the subject is being held what to do with that experience and how to incorporate that experience in their everyday life. This is usually missing. Mm -hmm. Reintegration. I used to say the uh, proper psychedelic ex experience means rights at setting and reintegration. So if reintegration is missing or uh, this all field on that, you can see long lasting uh, dissociative phenomenon, depersonalization. You could hear about cases when uh, the patient doesn't feel, uh, his, uh, himself, herself real, doesn't feel the world real, some very interesting negative hallucination can last for weeks. The person doesn't see herself here, himself in the mirror. Yeah, this kind of problem is true. And sometimes modern contemporary psychiatry doesn't know this kind of diagnostic issue. And I really, as a psychiatrist, I don't know whether it exists or not, but I see some case reports coming in what they call Kundalini experience. And the Kundalini, the subjective feeling that the Kundalini snake arises, a lot of energy, heat, impulsivity. We call these people bipolar, but Mustafa do not change too much this experience. So, as you see, yeah, not absolutely this <laughs> I will discuss, you know, what kind of conditions can be held uh, by others with the right set of conditions. More questions? Okay. Yes, sir. I'm gonna 
I'm curious about ayahuasca tourism, if this is a thing that has been uh, becoming more popular over the last decade with the uh, globalization of ayahuasca, and how this is perceived in South America and these places, if it's uh, seen as people who travel to take advantage of this kind of uh, spiritual experience, or uh, maybe it's uh, an opportunity for people there to take advantage of stupid culture. So, when we... But, uh, <coughs> so the ayahuasca tourism... Yeah, so well, I have... How does it affect... The I have thing? not... You know, the thing is that I have not done field work in Iquitos, this area. You know, when, I, when I did my last field work was in the, in the late uh, 80s, you know, perhaps the 90s, in the beginning of the 90s, then I only went back to Iquitos in the year 2000, which I was invited for the uh, 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 shamanistic conference there, uh, which I was amazed because when I was in the 80s in Iquitos, to find the ayahuasca, you had to go around, look for, you know, it was not easy. They were usually in the periphery and you have to have some kind of connection, you know, to, to know, to get, you know, um, to know one of them. Nowadays, I mean, it's just like a part of the tourist, you know, I mean, bird watching, uh, piranha fishing, ayahuasca session, you know, it's just part of it. Including a restaurant, they say, you know, the ayahuasca diet, you know, <laughs> some of no salt and so on. And apparently thousands of people are, are going there. I have not seen it and I'm almost afraid to go back to, <laughs> to eat it and see that soon, you know. But, uh, but on the other hand, I know that for many people have been very positive. You know? I know that they have been the charlatans, the people who are for the money, the, the abusers, you know, they have been cases, unfortunately, of, because uh, like, uh, Jeremy Narvi has a very good article in this uh, Ayahuasca Wheel, you know. The, the, the Ayahuasca is not your, is not your psychoanalyst, you know. Uh, you know. So then they go for the money and go for the girls, you know, as well. You know? So, so, so it's kind of mixed. At the same time, I know people who have been very serious, they have been doing the diet, you know, therapists, you know, who have been, been trained and all that, doing good work. So it's very mixed. You know. So I, I cannot say it's good or bad. It is, it's very interesting what is happening. And I think that a lot of people have got very much positive out of this. You know. At the same time, one has to be very careful. No, it's not. It's not just like taking a plane to Iquitos, and you know there will be a lot of ayahuasca. Hey, hey, you know, one has to be very careful and discern very well. You know who you are, you can trust, and so on. Yes, it's a frequent question from ayahuas or tourists. How can I uh, heal? I don't know the answer, but definitely I would look for a good healer among the humble ones. Yeah, yeah, yes. If somebody is telling. I'm a shaman, I'm very powerful of that, that means you know, it's not, <laughs> you know, because uh, at least when I, I was lucky even in the 80s, you know, done a medium, humble person, good humor, you know, never boasting at all, you know, and he was an ayahuasca twice per week. The rest of the time he was a peasant, he was attending his animals, you know, cultivating, you know, his crops, you know, so completely normal person living a humble life you know, so on. But the professional child, that I am a little bit, you know, because, you know, because. Yeah. Well, can I tell yeah. an example of the humbleness of Don Emilio, not the boy? Okay, yes. <laughs> you know that, uh, yeah, 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 I heard it from you. So, Louis would tell you that how humble the master was. <laughs> yes. The master yeah. used to be beaten up by his wife. <laughs> and imagine a master, or put it into contemporary Europe, and psychotherapy session when the psychotherapist is asking the patient, can we do psychotherapy today after my wife has been beaten up? <laughs> <laughs> so then this is humbleness. Yeah. 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 So, so it off? Off? Okay. Oh, okay, we have some here. Is it possible to treat or heal psych psychiatric disorders with ayahuasca? Oh, and right. which one okay. it's possible? 
Okay, you know, we are just at the very beginning of the controlled trials, and it's very difficult to start controlled trials with this kind of uh, pharmacological agents, you know, psychedelics. On the top of it, Ayasco, you cannot uh, give a synthetic compound. You know, pharmacoasco, yes, it exists out there, but if we want to try Ayahuasca as a medicine, it's a plant uh, brew. And the quality assurance is very difficult to maintain. So there are a lot of roadblocks to run uh, clinically controlled trials. So it's much easier, let's say, with psilocybin. So for this reason, you hear more about psilocybin as psychedelic medicine and research, or ibogain, the African shrub, when they can give the active ingredient of the tabernacle iboga plant. Uh, but uh, just observing, you know, Alaska sessions in the Amazon when the tourists come in with a lot of baggage. Guys, we Westerners, we carry a lot of baggages. Toxic relationships, toxic parents, you know, uh, uh, abuse from parents, not only uh, sexual and physical, but others, you know, if a father wanted to be a doctor, but he could not advance the son to be a doctor, that's an abuse. Very strict, uh, overly religious, uh, you know, environment when the self-actualization of the kid is prohibited. So you see what kind of uh, toxic uh, parenthood. You mean Susanna, uh, first book uh, you can find, you know, the typical toxic parent. So this is what I noticed that uh, the children of the toxic parents, you know, they can get over with some of the problems, which is traumatic. PTSD, possibly on the top of my list mm -hmm. for Ayahuasca treatment. But of course, PTSD is much severe trauma than having a parent with proper self-actualization, which can be very damaging, but PTSD is more deeper into the mind and soul. Uh, what else? Uh, anxiety disorders. So we have seen panic attacks which went away uh, because, let me put it very simply, if you can handle the dreadful ego dissolution on the Royasco, after a panic attack you look <laughs> <laughs> uh, Depression, there are Mm -hmm. Some studies out there that uh, Oyasco can be helpful against the depression because both components, the harming and the DMT, can have neuroregenerative neuro -regenerative effect. I will show you, I am studying how DMT uh, can uh, exert the section. So, absolutely done on my list is schizophrenia and bipolar disease. So, uh, bipolar disorder, so people with bipolar disorder history, they must be careful because an episode can kick in. You, you got the idea that our stock can boast the ego inflation, mm -hmm. so it can err on the manic side. And, uh, and I will show you what kind of medical use I propose. So in the next, 30 minutes, uh, I will discuss the most of the somatic effect of DMT, DMT treatment. More question? So is it possible to do some clear code? For the audio, 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 if you start it. No, no, no. So is it possible to do a clear code trial just in the DMT? I mean, how much of these uh, effects you mentioned on these disorders come from the DMT itself, or is there anything else in how you ask it that? that can you call it the ingredient? You will see from my presentation that it's pretty complex. Because definitely from Western pharmacology across all DMT, it's, it's very big effect, must be an important ingredient. But CAT, harming, mm -hmm. uh, last year the study came out, harming has a neural genetic effect, new neurons grow after CAT. And uh, you can hear from me that I pay very close attention to what indigenous people say. 
indigenous people say that the most sacred compound of the Oras was the cup. Western it was supposed to be there. So that put a bug into my mind. I don't know the answer, but definitely the bug is that we always go for visions. I will show you that we Westerners, we are much more into visions. And when indigenous people use ayahuasca, we are much more for the somatic effect, vomiting, diarrhea, pulpiting effect. Westerners, we consider it as a side effect, we try to avoid it. And in an ayahuasca healing ceremony, very frequently, that's the meaning. So, uh, you see, it's complex, you know. Uh, DNT, you will hear from me, yes, I can make the human studies, you can meet the link of the right. So, a time of thing uh, like that's how to extend the lifespan of the brain, the uh, lack of oxygen. And that will be one option. Oh, in coma. So, I can imagine the use of pure DNT, not a scope. Pure DNT in coma patient. I heard not absolutely comfort information that Schumacher, when he was in coma, they arranged to give him DNT. But because there was no control and who knows when he received it, we don't know if it was effective or not. But some people in the treatment team was thinking in the same direction as we. That possibly this uh, neuroregenerative effect which I will show to you about DNT, yes, you can utilize it after a traumatic brain injury, for example. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, lady, lady here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. so, so, what are your goals in the legislation? What? The legislation. Are you Absolutely. Goals? So you can make so I don't even dream that I can do this human experiment. I am happy that we can do in vitro. We start with the animal experience in vivo, but you can imagine we are not in this. But like, do you have any hopes that you can change? In some, some countries you can. You can see in the UK psychedelic research is flourishing. The authorities, they are very fancy. The Spain, you know, for the debate. Jordi Rigo has mm. studies uh, Netherlands, oh, Zurich, mm -hmm. so Frank, Frank, Franz von der Weyden. Mm -hmm. So there are centers and they are very open and they usually reported to me that they are very open-minded decision makers. They say, okay, just give us the results and we are interested. Maybe so this should is should be in addition to our track. <laughs> so this is my you know, motto, uh, I forgot to put at the end of my slide presentation, investigare and SSS. Mm -hmm. And this is sometimes forgotten in scientific circles, you know. The whole moratorium of not to study psychedelics for decades, it really wasn't the scientific, it was mostly political. Because science about study, bring the results pro or contra. Uh, the <laughs> scheduling of DMT, it was mostly based on political and social concerns and not on scientific, because DMT is scheduled uh, by the DEA as scheduled one, which means it is addictive, not DMT is not addictive. And scheduled one drugs, they have no medical use. And you see, in the Amazon basins, it has been in medical use for centuries.
reach this particular uh, philosophical stage. Uh, these songs, are they in the local Amazonian indigenous language or are they just melodies or? There, there are uh, both uh, in indigenous languages um, as well in Spanish, you know. My, my teacher sang in Spanish, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and there is a very interesting doctoral dissertation, a, a, a phenomenological study of the Icaro, they are called Icaros, of this, you know. So, the, so there is research done on, on that, you know. Can these songs or any recordings? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. On YouTube, you know, you go, uh, yeah, Icaro, they, are, they have been, yes. How to look it up? Pardon me? How to look them up? Icaros. Icaros. Yeah, Icaros. 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 Yes, as Louis said, that many, many Oyosko healers said, it is not Oyosko which heals the subject, but the Icaro, the music. So this is a very important message for music therapists. Yeah. Because in Europe we use both. What is the difference between the way we use music therapy and the way they use in Amazonas? Oyosko can increase some very, very uh, noble human faculty. For example, aesthetic feelings. Mm -hmm. So just think about it. Okay, so the aesthetic feelings is facilitated by Orosco, so maybe it facilitates the effect of music therapy. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And Orosco can increase moral feelings. It is called moral teacher. That mm -hmm. is from going by many methods of scholars as a moral teacher. Orosco can increase creativity. I published. It was a scientific paper, so from the point of view of the environment, 2012. You can find a human psychiatric drug. And since then, another paper came out from uh, Jordi Ribas' group mm -hmm. that I was going to have. You see, aesthetics, moral feelings, creativity, the most noble uh, human faculties inside can be increased. But I will have a slide about you know okay. what? Effect of it. Can you help me with the microphone? Happening 
it had been happening in the Amazon basin for in a research setting. And you know, his experiment was proved and followed by Rick Strassman, who gave DMT under the more controlled session, more controlled uh, clinical ratings intravenously. And you know, this person here, whom I consider to be a master. Uh, why I put up this slide, just to remind you that this culture, uh, which uh, right now provides by for the rest of the world, the new plans better than we do. Because if you look at your dinner table, many food stops, you know, we go from the Americas, so definitely those people know them well and listen to them. So, uh, this is our most recent paper, it was published last year and it has a very good alternative score from the 5% of all research. So basically my presentation deals what was written in that paper, really good. You know what I ask for is, I don't go into it, just, you know, harming, no harming, harming, harming is in the city and and harming is more neurotoxic and cause tremors. Harming is a reversible phenomenon in this individual, reversible, not the irreversible one. And if the DMT plant is psychotropic, the virus for it, the DMT plant is typoplase, then usually the name is Yahweh. So, the question they get from Jesuits how do you know what you think you know about how is it in psychotropic central genes? I told you at the beginning the German army used to pose these Jesuit questions to the indigenous people of the Amazon. And I like to pose these questions to my colleagues, who sometimes they have a very strong opinion about psychedelics from a very big source. Because really, what is the source of psychedelic knowledge in my profession? You know, those old textbooks, what you can find sometimes out there, sometimes patients reports, unexperienced patients report, because what is the real source of uh, professional information, scientific meetings, conferences, symposia, and it was only us who started, you know, psychedelic, psychedelic symposium uh, conference here. The first one in Hungary was in 2006 in Tihangen, who was there, my so that was the first psychedelic symposium. So that's the real source of professional information. So no wonder that even when they call themselves uh, professional experts, they have, according to a point of view, uh, very unsteady, shaky knowledge about these uh, pharmacological compounds. Just let's start with the naming. We don't have a good name for it. If we, we have 20 names for something, for me that's not the sign of knowledge. So, many of them absolutely wrong, especially at the bottom. I will show you all of them psychotomimetic, schizomimetic, so mixing block psychedelic effect, uh, effect experience with so this. You know, I thought it's a mistake. You know? uh, in the Amazon, I listen to many, many IOSCO uh, reports, you know, what uh, participants were reporting on my unit. You know, I can see those in the schizophrenic patients, guys. You know, the resemblance is very superficial. I will show you what is the difference. So, uh, a rich trust one prefers the psychedelic terminology and not the hallucinogen. Why not hallucinogen? Even the most hallucinogenic compound in many, many instances doesn't cause hallucination. Not as much visions, but inside other emotions and other experiences, not necessarily hallucinations, visions. And many times hallucinations, they are far away from being psychotic because the participant knows that it is not reality, but somebody with other reality, but definitely not this reality. So today, for today's purpose, I prefer the adaptogen, that was another definition. You coming up from the medical school, you will be surprised why, how I come up with this crazy idea that this stuff is adaptogen. So I will show you yes, there is a point behind it. And psychedelic, it has a connotation from the hippie era, but someone told me that this connot 
foundation is feeding God because new generations, you guys mostly, young guys, not my generation, they started to hear very you know, uh, little from the psychedelic residents. For the last 15 years, uh, psychedelic stories are flourishing, mushrooming, if I can use this <laughs> metaphor. Uh, and you can hear on the internet, uh, back portals, you know, all psychedelic, it's as a medicine, you know, it, can be, it can be useful against addiction, depression, post traumatic stress disorder. So some people, they don't communicate with these hippie trips much more about the medical use. So, psychedelics, hallucinogens, they got scheduled after 1966 because decision makers, they knew only the left side, you know? It was truly, yes, these uh, compounds, they can be disintegrated. No doubt in the emergency. Pleasure, like 
creation. So this is the real story from Louis. For me, it's interesting because if so many, almost 60 Indian tribes, they use Tati and they call it medicine on their own language. Here is how it travels. The most of these uh, Amazon languages consider us as a medicine. They must have a reason for that. So it is really Westerners who don't know very well we call this drug. But you see, according to my definition, uh, it is uh, not as much. And do you know why drug use is so difficult? So it, it's a chemical which has escapism. It's absolutely the opposite of therapy. Because what is the purpose of therapy? Be connected to life and helping the patient to enjoy life on, on its own merit. So you see, drug and therapy on the totally two different ends. So from this perspective, I was well much more on this side because it helps people to recommend to life. So this is about the use of oil well. and in indigenous people. I just emphasize what I told you before. They mostly focus on the somatic effect by Westerners. They focus on the visual effect, and you can see why. Tourists go into the Amazon. So, okay, I don't read the sign, but these are the typical reasons we are not tourists. You know, they search uh, the Oscar ceremonies. And this is an important slide. I depicted with different color. What can be the use of oil Oscar in Western therapy sessions? So, for example, uh, the lesions can have symbolic healings. The very profound cathartic emotions they can have, uh, and these visions they can have the larger type uh, of guided affective imagery. Uh, many people report on the progress of feelings like gratitude, being blessed, bliss, uh, redemption, all emotions for some very, very religious people can. Uh, have it and feel it very profoundly. This virus can give to, uh, to people in a cathartic level. And uh, it can uh, basically change cognitive framing, reframing. So, cognitive therapy can help it. I told you also, can it help inside? So, inside oriented psychotherapy probably uh, can use it. So, this is what we call. Psychedelic facilitated psychotherapy. We do not want to replace psychotherapy, but many times we know that patients are not, they don't have enough insight, uh, you know, and for this reason they are not ready for um, psychoanalysis, but that process can be facilitated. So, this is my study why the antitrictomy can be useful in. A clinical death, uh, oh, I have no time to discuss the receptor action, but basically, sigma receptor, what we discovered that uh, DNT, dinamic tryptamine, which hallucinogens, uh, you can synthesize yourself in your body, is acting on the sigma receptor, and sigma receptor is probably responsible for somatic effect and not as much effects. INT is in high concentration in the lung. Well, according to this model, it is not the pineal gland, but probably the lung is the source of huge amount of DMT at time of death. This uh, in seconds, DMT can be released because the enzyme is already synthesized. It doesn't have to start from gene expression, which can take long minutes, even half an hour. Uh, not within seconds, the individual <laughs> factor can uh, liberate the enzyme. After it, it, it detaches it from it, and within 15 seconds, uh, the lung can synthesize a psychedelic dose of DMT. The plasma monomium oxidase, contrary to the gut and liver monomium oxidase, does not affect DMT, doesn't break it down. DMT goes into the brain by free active processes, activities of the drug in the area, activities of the neural membrane, the serotonin transporter takes it in. And DNA is concentrated within vesicles. 
What compounds cross the blood brain barrier by an active transport? Glucose, amino acids, vitamin C, vitamin E, which are vital. You see, <laughs> and DMT belongs to this highly effluent group. So probably the brain does uh, knows why uh, it's accumulating DMT. Sigma receptor is a very interesting intracellular chakra protein sitting between the mitochondria and which is the powerhouse of the cell and the endoplasmic reticulum which is the factory of the cell and buffering the need between those two. So we, there is some hiccups in the oxygen energy supply. Sigma receptors seem to ameliorate that problem. So this is the overlap of DNT effect with near-death experience. So this is just a phenomenological indication that uh, DMT can be released during near death and can be part of that very complex experience. So we are not saying that every near death experience is related to DMT, but you can see the feeling of presence, it is talking and it is uh, life in you. So according to this theory, so at time of agony, DMT is released and it can help through the sigma receptors decreasing the oxygen need, the energy need of the neurons. And this was our result from last year. At the bottom you can see uh, cells who are in 0.5% oxygen, they are dying pretty fast. And if you add in to the petri dish, you see that their survival approaches to those neurons which have a normal sleep condition. This is not this is the tablet excess. And DMT has a profound anti-inflammatory effect. So pro-inflammatory proteins, uh, no, they are like cytokines, they are inhibited by DMT, and anti-inflammatory interleukin 10 can be increased by DMT. And this is the same Basically, that it shows that a large effect, anti pro inflammatory effect of DMT is mediated through the sigma receptor and probably one third of it is to another receptor. Okay, so basically, uh, it's an increasing concept that in a sense of civilization, they have controlled inflammation in the background and uh, you know, this kind of civilizatory illnesses. Uh, they can mitigate it through the sigma receptor action. I am not saying that in a disease of civilization, they are a result of some sigma receptor problem. Sigma receptor not about animals, they can live, even they can multiply in the animal house. But if you put them in the nature and there is a lot of stress, they are probably cannot survive well. So the point is that not that uh, every disease of civilization has a sigma receptor deficit, but agonistic effect on the sigma receptor can mitigate these problems. What is the sigma receptor? What kind of processes it can influence? And basically, this is my concluding uh, slide that the psychedelic effect of DNA really represents. The island is a huge amusement park for it. But as you see, all research interest is shifting away. We are focusing on the physiological and the somatophysiological effect. For the last 40 years, DMT was considered to have psychopathological function. It's a paradigm shift on two terms, not psychopathological, probably DMT we have and synthesis for the somatophysiological purposes. Okay, thank you for your attention.